I'm President Catherine Rowe, and I'm really honored to be able to join you in the second leg of the Board 2026 Conference. It's co-sponsored by William and Mary, the Alejandro Institute, and Claudia Williamsburg. And I want to welcome everyone in the room here. I know there are uh, members of our far flung community, there are colleagues who are scholars and researchers, there are fellow travelers in this lead up to the quarter millennium that we're engaged in here in Williamsburg. There are faculty and staff and students and neighbors and friends and not the parents, I think, and grandparents in the room here because of the parents and his family and it was I I thought I'd start this session with a reflection and then some words of gratitude and then introduce our extraordinary speaker. Our conference theme is Contested Freedoms, a theme that comes right now in a milestone year. Many of you know that 2023 is the 300th anniversary of the Rafferty Indian School at William & Mary. I wanted to thank Dr. Anne-Marie Stock and the team in the Office of Strategic Cultural Partnerships yes, for coordinating William & Mary's year-long commemoration, which began in February on Charter Day and it began with the formal visit of distinguished leaders representing neighboring tribes with ties to that rapid and Indian school that go back centuries. During that ceremony, Chief Lynette Alston of the Nottoway Indian tribe of Virginia reflected on the significance of our connections here, uh, laterally, over space, and over time, past, present, and very much looking toward the future, how we tell the story of the past for the purposes of creating the future we want and believe in. She said, and I'm quoting her, like our ancestors who traveled to Williamsburg in 1677 to negotiate a treaty of peace, we have come in 2023 to construct a new relationship built on the foundation of shared history and mutual respect for all time coming. Go ahead, I'll let you turn your thoughts on it. This is where you practice that. Um, with that in mind, I want to kick off, as we do, most formal, that wonderful phrase of hers in mind, most formal um, events at William & Mary with our land acknowledgement, which was created in my second year, I think, here with our board. And I'm going to ask Professor Troy, we who you are, to come up and share that with us. Thank you. William and Mary acknowledges the indigenous people who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. The Cherenaka, Nottoway, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Mattapanai, Monacan, Nansaman, Nottoway, Pamunkey, Ottawa, Upper Mattapanai, and Rappahannock tribes. And pay our respect to the tribal members past and present. Thank you, Professor Pamunkey. So those words were ones that were created together with seven tribal leaders and their communities who are our closest partners in the region. Uh, and we're, we're proud to have their words as, as, as also um, Chief Alston's words kick us off tonight for the work that we do. Um, this is the work of this conference series, which is to use our past in the present to, to study the history to expand our understanding of current challenges so we can realize opportunities for the future. And one of the things that's become so powerful and clear in recent years is how much of that history is there. As a 17th century scholar in graduate school, I was taught regularly that there was nothing to recapture, nothing to recover. No, no stories of those who we thought if we um, had never uh, seen as a central part of the founding narratives of our fields as well as of our nation. Um, you've just heard that land acknowledgement read by Troy Bupongui, a faculty fellow in our Office for Strategic Cultural Partnerships. That statement begins all of our cherished ceremonies because one of the things that we aim to do is uncover the stories that are still there, that have not been looked for or sought. So many voices that have not been looked for or sought. So I, I want to 
say a few more words of thanks because what we are in the business of today is the fruit of so many decades of research into the history of marginalized communities in this area, and in particular the history of the Brown and Indian School. And I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge the leadership of professors Danielle already Langholz and Buff Woodard. I'm looking around. I thought you were right up in the corner. Yes, I see at least heading now. Um, but those pioneers have gone to extraordinary lengths to show us that what I was taught in the 1980s and the 1990s was wrong. That there are many, many voices and many, many stories of founding, of revolution that we have yet to discover. The research here at William & Mary is part of a steady and purposeful and actively committed path that we're on to use our prowess of teaching and learning and discovery to expand the partnerships, who we think of as the partners in research, who defines research questions. The great Lily Macarion at the Women's Center at Wellesley says, research plus leadership equals accelerated social change, right? That's an incredible, powerful way of framing what we're about together in communities of research. Our keynote speaker puts the histories of indigenous communities at the center of U.S. history in exactly these ways. Professor Ned Blackhawk is an enrolled member of the Timok tribe of Western Shoshone in the Indians of Nevada. He teaches history and American studies at Yale. His latest book, The Rediscovery of America, shows how Native Americans are essential to our understanding of the evolution of America. This week, I'm really pleased to say, the title was shortlisted for the National Book Award. Pretty cool. So, so you are getting right like the leading edge of research tonight, and it's incredibly exciting to have you here. So we're honored to give uh, Professor Ned Blackhoff a classic, loud, literary welcome. Please join me in taking a moment. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's really my extreme pleasure and honor to be here. I'm delighted to be this year's keynote speaker for the Omohundro Center's conference, Contested Freedoms for 2026. Um, the Omohundro Institute I know has concluded, there is concluding its annual conference today. And if those of you in the room may not know, uh, who, ha who are not part of the conference, may not, uh, if you're not familiar with the Institute, it is the leading, and has been for an incredibly long time, uh, organization for the study of early America. Um, and its presence um, really goes, uh, needs no introduction in the field of American history. So it's my extreme honor and privilege to be here. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, all the staff members, um, President Rowe and uh, others who've helped make this event uh, possible. My presentation is a bit academic. Um, I'm perhaps doing more of the leadership, I mean the research than the leadership in that equation that uh, we just heard about, um, or trying to. Um, and it draws upon some of the early chapters of my new book, uh, The Rediscovery of America. And it also attends, attempts to extend them. I'm here particularly to offer a potential reorientation or reinterpretation of the Declaration of Independence and its last set of, quote, injuries and usurpations, wherein, as many of us may know, the Declaration's drafters linked English colonists' fears of Indians 
really more linked English colonists' hatred of Indians to Republican fears of a tyrannical monarchy. As they wrote, the Crown, quote, has endeavored to bring, upon, to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all. Many, many people have assessed these dramatic words and determinative moments. And chapter five in my new book, entitled Settler Uprising, historicizes them, these words, within a broader regional, imperial, and ultimately indigenous context. It begins in early 1763 at the end of the Seven Years' War with select moments of euphoria drawn from across British North America. A Maine farmer's almanac. Optimistic pronouncements within a Boston town meeting and expressions of fealty to the English crown. It then moves from these Eastern locations, which are much more familiar within the academic study of this period, into an interior region or world that I introduce in the previous chapter entitled The Native Inland Sea. And that chapter title is taken from a poem by an Ojibwe writer. Bame Wawa Gaze He Kakwe, whose early 19th century verse lines written at Castle Island Lake Superior celebrates what she terms the quote, sweet delight of her homelands known in Ojibwe as Anishinaabe Waki. And my Ojibwe uh, colleagues here, I hope can forgive some of my pronunciation. Here she writes about Lake Superior. Only nature reigns. Far from the haunts of men. Here there are no sordid fears, no crimes, no misery, no tears. No pride of wealth, the heart to fill no laws to treat my people ill. It is upon the eastern borders of the native inland sea that chapter five, which I'll be talking about this evening, locates what I've termed the indigenous origins of the American Revolution. Despite England's global victory, across this interior world, the war had not ended. Independent Indian villages remained unconquered after the French withdrawal. Many had formed or were in the process of forming confederations who soon became prominent adversaries to the English crown. Their power, one settler wrote, quote, is generally known and understood. Returning to the interior and beginning in that fateful year, chapter five tracks a very familiar emphasis found throughout many recent studies. That is the growing tension between interior settlers and crown officials over the renewed trade, diplomacy, and negotiations with native nations that the crown increasingly began after the Seven Years' War. As a work of interpretive synthesis, this chapter inherently revolves around insights drawn from others and if I've yet to personally thank those gathered here this weekend whose works have informed these chapters, please accept my appreciations now. Despite such recent inquiry, however, much more is still needed to deliver upon the field's often latent suggestions. Historians of early America and the revolutionary era have yet to trace sufficiently the formation of the Declaration's anti-Indigenous ideology, nor gauge its manifest legacies. Chapter five, I believe, offers some guidance. It argues that the founders' concerns about frontier 
inhabitants and merciless Indian savages originated in this interior world, particularly in the conflicts that arose following the outbreak of Pontiac's War in the summer of 1763. If we're not familiar with Pontiac's War, it concludes uh, the previous chapter in chapter four, and I'll try as best I can to uh, put some um, insight or familiarity into that subject moving forward. I believe that analyses of these settler uprisings offer a series of important interpretive possibilities. First, they suggest a need for an alternative periodization of England's crisis of empire and the estrangement of its colonial subjects. Second, it locates the Declaration's appeal within a larger law of nations legal discourse as revolutionary leaders increasingly sought international recognition and use the Declaration's most injurious grievance in that process. Third, such analyses suggest that, that these long-standing colonial sentiments form an underrecognized but essential cornerstone in emergent forms of Republican so uh, political sovereignty. That's a really big challenge to some long-standing paradigms in the field that I'd be happy to talk about hereafter. And the last suggestion that I believe such analysis yields is that it establishes anti-indigenous ideologies, practices, and legacies as inestimable challenges confronting Native peoples themselves. An enveloping discursive field, essentially, of anti-indigenous sentiment pervaded the colonial world that did much to galvanize the revolutionary struggle more broadly. I've yet to really assess this following claim thoroughly, but one might conclude that the Declaration's anti-indigenous sentiments incited and legitimated violence against indigenous peoples themselves. Following this overview, I trace a few connection connections between these frontier rebels, as one scholar terms them, and the justifications that culminated in the Continental Congress's declarations from 1775 and the more famous one from 1776, each of which articulated various anti-indigenous grievances against the crown. Across the Pennsylvania backcountry, vilification united colonists around existing fears and ultimately a common cause. Indeed, the first shots fired by insurgents against British officials occurred in March 1765 when interior rebels under the leadership of a settler named James Smith and his militia known as Black Boys confronted English commanders ferrying pack trains to Fort Pitt, which is where the city of Pittsburgh is now located. They had traveled hundreds of miles along the Forbes Road, which connects Philadelphia or connected Philadelphia and Pittsburgh throughout the early Republican world. And they did so to provision anticipated summer gatherings that were to be held that year with Pontiac's Confederacy who had fought in the summer of 1763, the English forces uh, to a standstill at many forts. They'd burned nine out of the 13 inherited forts that the English crown had obtained from the French Empire at the Treaty of Paris in 1763. Uh, they had organized a series of surprise attacks against en English commanders and essentially demonstrated to the English crown that peace in the interior could be just as costly as war itself essentially forcing, as scholars have long suggested, um, that the English would have to come onto a kind of terrain of mutuality if they were going to try to govern in this newly acquired world. And for those of us who haven't been studying early American history for some time, 
Uh, the Treaty of Paris in 1763, in the Treaty of Paris in 1763, the French Empire in North America is ceded to the British Crown. And its colony, known as New France, it was the largest colony in North America at the time, thereby doubling the territorial size of British North America to the point at which one could walk now from Florida, which also became part of the British Empire, to Hudson's Bay and stay within the territorial jurisdiction and or sovereignty of the English Crown. That war, for those in the field, this would be familiar, has recently, or relatively recently, been termed the most important war of the 18th century by the very famous and influential historian named Fred Anderson. So this is in 1765, two years after the outbreak of that war, when British commanders are bringing trade goods into the interior. Throughout that fateful spring of 1765, this countryside, as another scholar has written, had come alive with fear. Smith's militias attacked supply trains destined for native peoples. They lay siege to British forts themselves. They committed arson, evaded prosecution, circulated notices that denounced imperial policies, and eventually even crafted memorials in song and verse that celebrated violence against whom they termed, in 1765, the enemies of mankind. Um, Okay, so I just was trying to explain what the summer of 1765 looked and felt like in this interior world that had come alive with fear, as Peter Silver has written. Uh, militias start attacking British supply lines destined for native peoples. They lay siege to British forts, commit arson, evade prosecution. And they even craft memorials that celebrated their violence, including an informal anthem that has never been named the Black Boys Anthem, but maybe we can think of it as such, which proceeds as follows. Let mankind censure or commend this rash performance in the end. Then both sides will fill their account. Tis true no law can justify to burn our neighbor's property, but when this property is designed to serve the enemies of mankind, it's high treason in the amount. Smith's uprising occurred at the end of Pontiac's War, whose origins and course figure earlier in the narrative and are located within a much longer history of French, Algonquian, and Iroquoian relations, among others. And by 1765, this militia leader, his men, and every official in Pennsylvania were already familiar not only with Indian warfare in the interior, but also another settlers' rebellion that had begun during the first year of Pontiac's War in December of 1763. That uprising led by a group of settlers who called themselves the Paxton Boys, targeted missionized Conestoga Indians who, quote, had lived in peace for nearly a century in the neighborhood of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. As Edward Shippen, when Lancaster Settler wrote, they in this region feared that Pontiac's Confederacy represented a deep plan for the extermination of all. A diverse community of Native nations that formed in 1701, Conestoga's community had been allied with Pennsylvania's leaders for almost six and a half decades, and not with the interior military indigenous, uh, not militarily with the interior's native confeder confederations. They lived in proximity with the colony's diverse constituents. They worked as broom and basket makers, domestic servants and farmhands, and they learned to write and, write and read the English language. Many attended Sunday services. Moreover, they believed that they were protected by the governor and the colonial legislature with whom they had interacted since the early 1700s, including William Penn himself, the founder of the colony. They were mistaken. The challenges of the Seven Year War had fallen so disproportionately on interior settlers that they grew frustrated with England's new land policies such as the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which was passed in October, shortly after Pontiac's War erupted that summer. 
And they were very disappointed and fearful of policies of which they perceived as appeasement towards native peoples. Such fears made these years unlike any other beforehand. Allegations that these Indian villagers in Lancaster, which is closer to Philadelphia than it is to um, um, Fort Pitt, um, but nonetheless, uh, the allegations had been made that these uh, uh, indigenous villagers had been trading with Pontiac's peoples in the interior, ferrying information, trade, and most worrisomely, ammunition and weaponry. And these fears culminated on December 14th of 1763 when vigilantes began killing and driving hundreds away. In February of 1764, a few months later, or six and a half weeks later, an estimated 500 of these settlers marched on Philadelphia itself. They did so according to one of their participants, quote, with a view to assault the barracks and murder the Indians. As they announced that they would not only kill the 140 villagers who were taking shelter in close proximity to English forces, but they would also do so to any sympathetic colonists whom they regarded as complicit. Very briefly, we've heard then of, a, of settler rebellions happening in 1763. We just heard of a group marching on Philadelphia in 1764, and we'll hear more about the black boys from 1765. These settler rebellions targeted not only native peoples, but the institutions of British authority surrounding them. British leaders simultaneously struggled to enforce policies and prosecute those who violated them. Throughout the 1760s, Governor John Penn lost the authority to do both. In 1768, he received a note of sympathy from his Virginia uh, governor counterpart, who shared similar concerns about Western settlers. And he wrote, I have found by experience it is impossible to bring anybody to justice for the murder of an Indian who takes shelter among our backcountry inhabitants. It is among those people, he doesn't use the term frontier inhabitants, but we'll see that term again shortly. It is among those people looked on as a meritorious action. Violence between interior colonists and native communities in short destabilized imperial authority and deepened solidarities among settlers. Indians were not to be trusted, nor increasingly were imperial officials working towards diplomatic resolution. Settlers denounced authorities for using public funds to support so-called friendly Indians while doing little to protect whites, and many believe that the commanding general of North America, General Jeffrey Amherst, bore responsibility for Pontiac's war which in its first summer had forced 1,384 settlers off their farms in the interior. As Shippen further explained or wrote again, Amherst, quote, ought immediately to have sent up men. Shippen further recommended, quote, a good reward offered for scalps would be the most effective way of quelling the Indians. Outraged by the violence of Pontiac's war and perceived favoritism following the proclamation, frontier inhabitants now organized themselves into settler militias. They even issued their own declarations, and one entitled Declaration of the Injured Frontier Inhabitants. 1764, Frontier Inhabitants finds its way into an earlier declaration that justified the region's growing vigilantism. Initially, Pennsylvania's leaders, including Benjamin Franklin, abhorred these militias. They feared their wanton use of violence. And P Franklin wrote an extensive and impassioned pamphlet in 1764 entitled, A Narrative of the Late Massacres, in which he indicts these perpetrators while also expressing his steadfast loyalty to the crown. Such violence, he, wrote, he writes, Quote, is done by no civilized nation, especially not against their friends. Their only crime seems to have been that they had a reddish brown skin and black hair. I thus publicly call on the makers 
and vendors of these accusations to produce their evidence. What had little boys and girls done? What could a child of a year old, what could they do that they must be shot and hatcheted? Franklin and other legislative leaders heated off the Paxson boys' encroachment to Philadelphia, diffusing their fury while also offering exonerations for their behavior. And in fact, the following summer, the legislative body of Pennsylvania did in fact issue scalp bounties, further inciting settler militia formations and justifying their actions. A political culture was forming that disdained Indians as well as the Eastern officials who supported them. Penn pleaded to General Thomas Gage, who had replaced Amherst the previous November. Amherst essentially loses his appointment because of Pontiac, Pontiac's war's initial successes. And Penn pleads to the new uh, commanding general, British North America, Gage, for increased troops to quell this unrest. But Gage's priorities were elsewhere, particularly in the interior. He had little interest in policing mob violence. Pennsylvania would have to defuse its own settlers. Among the many ironies of this period, Gage's mobilizations throughout 1764 and the growing diplomatic accords that follow brought little of the euphoria that had greeted the end of the previous war. On the contrary, peace with Indians was to be feared, not celebrated. Any form of diplomatic negotiation for many interior settlers suggested the continued autonomy of native peoples. When imperial leaders, including a famous traitor come diplomat by the name of George Crohan that many of you may have heard of in studies of this subject matter, when they arrived optimistically to Fort Pitt in early 1765 in February, they anticipated restoring lost trading partnerships in the interior and consolidating England's profitable new monopoly over continental furs. The French empire was gone. The vast interior world awaited a kind of expanded form of English dominion and economic opportunity. A summer of peace, trade, and assurances they believed awaited. They too were mistaken. Another settler militia had formed and it targeted Britain's commitments to provisioning native peoples. These, they were called the black boys because they, quote, painted faces red and black like Indian warriors, as James Smith later recalled. They did so to impart, quote, Indian discipline, as I know of no other at that time which would answer the purpose. The core of their ideology held that native peoples deserved no place in the region. It was a belief they were willing to kill and die for. Because as much as anything, these militia members feared becoming involved in another prolonged war in which Smith summarized, quote, the frontiers received no assistance from the state. For those familiar or, uh, in relationship with the earlier history of Pontiac's war, um, I write that like Pontiac and some of his other followers, quote, the black boys believed in radical, not consensual reforms. And this is really one of the main legacies and paradoxes of this period of American history is that the expulsion of the French empire um, generated so many kind of competing forms of fear and uncertainties that uh, really were beyond the capacity of any imperial authority to uh, mitigate and or resolve them. So starting on March 6th, Groups of armed rebels intercepted Crohan's supply trains. They burned them. They forced the return of the traitors. They even lay siege to English forts. These were not, however, raiders. They were insurgents, not thieves. Politics, not pillage, was their intention. Throughout March, these raids, skirmishes, and confusions erupted across western Pennsylvania. Leaders at English forts, such as Charles Grant at a place called Fort Loudoun, captured and then subsequently released several of Smith's men, even negotiating with Smith himself within the fort rather than arresting him. There was some confusion, as Gage's behavior previously indicated, about the actual role of the British Army in policing civilian or civil uh, disputes. Attempts to organize grand juries failed. 
as jury members at places like Carlisle told the court, quote, that there was not sufficient testimony to convict a single person. Well, they also reminded the court leaders of their shared hostility towards Indians. In short, the foundations of British authority in the interior were crumbling. An emergent settler sovereignty had formed. James Smith grew in standing in the years that followed. In 1776, he was uh, selected as a delegate to Pennsylvania's Constitutional Convention, where he was joined by his compatriot, John Moore, who joined the committee to write the state's Declaration of Rights. Unsurprisingly, just as anti-indigenous sentiments animated their earlier writings, behaviors, and actions, or earlier writings, beliefs, and actions. Similar sentiments appear throughout other revolutionary era texts and declarations, some of them drafted in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia. And by 1776, of course, critiques of Eastern elites, English policies, and monarchical impositions had crystallized into a, a widely shared political culture as well as ideology. What one scholar has termed an emergent, quote, settler republicanism. New governments were now needed for, quote, the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, and not for the particular advantage of a single man, family, or set of men. So reads Pennsylvania's constitution, state constitution, written in part by former black boy militia members. Similar pronouncements had been made across the colonial and revolutionary world. In fact, declarations and grievances, statements of grievances had been on paper and, and in public discussion since the Stamp Act of 1765. Uh, Fred Kaplan has recently written in a study of Thomas Jefferson's political writings. Jefferson in 1775, in the Continental Congress's Declaration for Causes and Necessities of Taking Up Arms, known as the Declaration of 1775 to some, writes that we fight not for glory or for conquest. We exhibit to mankind the remarkable spectacle of a people attacked by unprovoked enemies. Scholars of the field will know that this declaration was accompanied by something known as the Olive Branch Petition of July 8, 1775, presented to the Crown, which offers an incredibly revealing review of the previous decade's history. Its first substantive paragraph begins, at the conclusion, therefore, of the late war, the most glorious and advantageous that ever had been carried on by British arms. Your loyal colonists, having contributed to its success by such repeated and strenuous exertions, doubted not, but they should be permitted with the rest of the empire to share in the blessings of peace and the emoluments of victory and conquest. Emoluments. It's a lot easier to type that than to pronounce that. I believe that scholars of early America would be well served further analyzing the rhetoric, power, and fears about the late war, as the colonists termed the Seven Years' War. The Olive Branch continues its concerns, indicating that the Congress, quote, shall decline the ungrateful task of tracing through a series of years past the progress of unhappy differences between Great Britain and these colonies, which have flowed from this fatal source. Fred Anderson, who I mentioned in Crucible of War, de describes the period between the Black Boys Uprising and the Olive Branch Petition as, quote, a decade-long effort to deal with the legacies of a great war and prodigal victory, an effort that instead of solutions generated a constitutional stalemate. Smith's concerns and those of other settler communities suggests that other forms of constitutionalism were also generated. The growing estrangement between the colony and the crown, or between colony and crown, originated in part over the place of native peoples in British North America, a claim that has been insufficiently made in numerous 
studies of the revolution's origins. These indigenous origins of such, quote, unhappy differences have been sidelined, not only in studies of the revolution, but of US history more broadly, contributing, as I've argued elsewhere, to the construction of American history's iron cages of erasure, historiographical habits that have elided rather than foregrounded indigenous subjects and agency within our nation's past. Clearly, by 1775, colonial leaders from north to south, from seaport to interior, shared similar beliefs that the spoils of victory and conquest, as they termed it, had not been sufficiently distributed, and that the crown's priorities were with the colonists, quote, enemies, rather than with them. The Declaration of Independence concludes with this grievance, a conclusion that is in many ways the crescendo of the text. The culmination of the Declaration of Independence sits with the inhabitants of our frontiers, whose antagonists are not the crown itself, but merciless Indian savages whose known role of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Once characterized as the enemies of mankind by the black boys, native peoples are declared in the chartering document of the United States of America as merciless and savage who only know warfare and destruction. Labeled as surrogates or proxies operating on behalf of a distant tyrant, native peoples now became vilified in a larger ideological transformation that distanced colonists from their British kin. I hope I have demonstrated that it was within this interior world that a distinctive anti-indigenous revolutionary ideology formed one in which Indian peoples had limited, if not no space or future. Moreover, such grievances predated the Stamp Act of 1765 and centered more on the recognition of native nations than on more familiar crown abuses. Historians have overlooked largely the place of these frontier communities within the revolutionary struggle. Not only militia, but also civilian leaders such as James Wilson of Carlisle shaped the era. They organized the, the region's first committee of correspondence, drafted Pennsylvania's constitution, as we've seen, and signed the declaration itself. In a field historically preoccupied with seaport leaders and gentry classes, Indians and their interior antagonists remain in the background or in this case, lost in the interior. Ultimately, and perhaps here's the concerns about the present that I know many of us carry in conversations such as these. Ultimately, our inability to understand the Declaration more fully offers all of us fewer strategies for articulating our most self-evident truths because these truths do also include a modification of the Declaration's vilifications of Indians. As I detail in chapter six on the Constitution, the federal government's exclusive authority to oversee and maintain relations with native nations was codified into Article One, uh, and particularly into the Article One and the Commerce Clause, and represents a rare form of consensus that animated the Constitutional Convention. Such recognition evolved partly out of the violence engendered by settler communities themselves, whose defiance of federal authority incensed national leaders um, repeatedly throughout the era. Um, people like Washington, who understood that Indian affairs had to remain outside the jurisdiction of state and local governments for there to be any form of political stability. I could talk about the Constitution in that chapter if needed, um, but maybe uh, we'll close with the following remarks. That as we prepare for 2026, which I know has the, been the animating, organizing theme of uh, the weekend's gathering for many of us here, let us revisit the Declaration's history and do so to name and gauge, if not excise, its language of hatred. 
while it continues to be seen as a stunning rhetorical feat and an act of extraordinary political culture, it, like the Constitution, has more than one limitation, what some might call an original sin. Its failures include not only an inability in halting critiques of slavery, but also in the legitimization of violence against Native peoples. The Declaration authorizes a vilification of Native Americans, which, like Afri African American slavery, our founders failed to resolve. Many also profited from the violence that brought countless Indian lands into the Republic while it, uh, establishing extraordinary suffering and lasting harms for tens of thousands, thousands of Native nations or Native peoples who confronted a newly independent Republic shortly thereafter. Thank you very much. I'm happy to have an open conversation about this subject and potentially any others that may be found in uh, my new, newly released uh, study. I'm happy to improvise. <laughs> Here's a question um, in the... But um, I was wondering, for the Southern Theater mm -hmm. and the 1763 proclamation line and the subsequent decimation of Cherokee villages by militia using all sorts of explanations for why they do those things, is that... It's, it's a really interesting and important question. I, I think most everyone heard it. Um, the question is about essentially comparable theaters or processes occurring across the interior south, not only the mid-Atlantic backcountry regions. And I would, I would be remiss if I didn't say that this new book that I've written does try to, while it does try to provide an overview of Native American history, I didn't really talk about its structure and form in certain, form, uh, in certain ways um, yet, but it is divided in two halves. The first half is essentially the history of Native peoples within what is commonly understood it to be the U.S. colonial period. Uh, it's called Part One, and its um, subtitle is Indians and Empires. And so there's six chapters. This is chapter five you heard from. I referenced chapters four and six. The first, the, these six chapters kind of chronicle or examine um, imperial indigenous relations roughly to the uh, ratification of the Constitution. The second half of the book, part two, um, is titled Struggles for Sovereignty. And it essentially looks at federal Indian affairs throughout the early Republic, throughout the 19th and through the 20th centuries. And so while it has a kind of temporal um, overview or kind of attempted overview, it is by no means regionally or ethnographically or kind of tribally uh, comprehensive. And it kind of reflects, if not the field, my understanding of it. Um, and it is really a, perhaps an invitation for continued engagement uh, in these subjects. And so one of its limitations may be, um, you know, is, I, I understood this throughout, that one of its really central limits in this, in this first half is a relatively exclusive focus on certain theaters or imperial and or um, indigenous regions. Um, so the interior south, um, the Floridian uh, history, uh, Carolinian uh, Piedmont histories are just only generally um, gestured towards. Uh, but they appear more in the 19th century during Cherokee uh, legal advocacy struggles during the removal era. So it's really an invitation, chapter five, to uh, look at comparable forms of other settler uprisings, we might call them, or as I call them, um, in places like the back country of Virginia, the interior uh, southeast, up and through uh, Cherokee country uh, from Ger uh, Georgia and the Carolinas, and perhaps see um, uh, similar types of dynamics. And I think the real, right, you know, I. I I was really hopeful 
to be able to talk in some capacity in this conference and community is to encourage us to see these patterns elsewhere. And so it seems pretty apparent to me that the state of Pennsylvania's constitution had a heavy imprint from these processes. Um, I'm not super familiar with the kind of state uh, constitutional histories of other colonies turned states, but th that might be a really interesting place to look. How did these patterns find their way into essentially the structuring legal jot documents of the colonial now state governing bodies? Who did they elect to serve in that process? Who drafted them? Who, sent, who did they send to Philadelphia in 1787? Who did they send to their legislative, uh, um, to the early Continental Congress and uh, to the articles, um, legislative meetings? Those, if we can learn the kind of biographical histories, more of folks like James Smith or um, those that I referenced, we might see these subjects more clearly. That's a not a sufficient, perhaps, a response um, to your particular question, but more of a general, hopeful. Um, this is taking an opportunity to ask the scholars here to do some work. Um, <laughs> there was a separate treaty in 1764, Augusta Treaty. Okay. where um, the Cherokee and other tribes signed a uh, treaty sort of ratifying the 1763 proclamation. Okay. And then the settlers decided they were just going to continue to move westward. And it resulted in pure decimation of Cherokee villages in 1776. So. Right, it followed you know, during the revolution. And um, some of the theater, military theaters that are kind of known in the literature to um, mm -hmm. So we need some more work on North Carolina, please. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Kathy Kelly. I'm the executive director of the Illinois Neuro Institute. Thank you all so much for coming, and then thank you for a really provocative talk. And I was struck, I was struck at the end by a reference you made to reorienting our thinking about the revolution away from seaport cities um, and people like John Adams, I suppose, yeah. and toward the interior. And it, it made me think about a truly productive conversation that we had this morning in a session on teaching the American Revolution that many of you all were here, many of you here today were at, you were not, because you were getting here to give this talk tonight. But there was this really provocative discussion about new or, or productive ways of framing the American Revolution as a civil war. And it was a, it was a generative, I uh, have an exciting discussion. And one of the things that I was thinking about as I was listening to Serena um, and Michael talk about the revolution was that when we think about the revolution, we formulate it as a civil war. I never, I find that really compelling when I think about the Eastern Seaboard. I'm not sure quite what I think of, I don't, I'm not sure what that does with the interior. And to be fair, you did write a book about the revolution. You wrote a book about the long durée of US history, centering the indigenous history. But I'm wondering if you would, if you would respond to this or could respond to this at all, thinking about how this interior focus really does shake up or frame or intervene in a consideration of the American Revolution as a civil war. Does it mean that the American Revolution was multiple things, including a civil war? Does it mean we push in another direction? I don't have an answer to that, but I think you and other folks in this room might think. I think there's a great compromise that has gone under identified. And I don't know what it is, but it seems to have happened. When the, these interior concerns ultimately find acceptance within these Eastern uh, spaces. So someone like Franklin, um, uh, who lose his legislative uh, seat because of his defense uh, against the Paxson boys. Um, uh, at, some, at some point, the more familiar revolutionary leaders that we are aware of begin um, taking these concerns either more seriously, accepting them, and or using them. And I didn't really have any time to really talk about some of those suggestions about like, the law of nations and how 
uh, once the, the colonists are appealing into kind of international discourse for kind of justifying their uh, revolutionary ambitions, they're essentially trying to say, these are the worst things that could possibly be happening to us. Like the, the, the crown is um, uh, sending savages to kill us, right? So that is not just um, a concern about Indians, but a, a kind of a, a proclamation to kind of a global legal culture of sorts that is forming, that is, uh, as a, a forms a kind of justification for a kind of a revolutionary um, sentiments. It's a, obviously a very complex and heavily studied subject. Um, it's hard to distill into certain essences, but I found this, the Olive Branch's kind of identification of the Seven Years' War as the fatal source so compelling that um, I almost wish Anderson uh, would have written a second book about this next decade that came uh, to really kind of lay bare the centrality of some of these concerns. Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm uh, one of the senior students in um, a seminar for anthropology on native sovereignty with Dr. Marty Langholz. And um, she very wisely and smartly put your book on our reading list, actually. And so we've been talking about it in our seminar um, and have been fortunate enough to read some of it. So I have actually a lot of questions for you, but I'm going to try to kind of synthesize it into like one and a half. Um, so something that we thought was really interesting um, about the structure of your writing is this kind of really beautiful like storytelling narrative and how you're like framing this history but with this very like with, with these very like visceral pictures or images of like what's going on and I was just wondering like how much of that was deliberate like your framework of it does that help kind of like make the history more accessible when it kind of is in this framework of almost like a novel but also it is like legitimate history um and so i'm just kind of curious about like what your path was with that and then secondarily to that too just the fact that like there are so many fragmented pieces of like what sovereignty looks like and these different spaces of sovereignty and like federal recognition versus survivance versus refusal and like all of these different scholarly ideas or you know different tribal nation ideas of what that's supposed to look like like to you based on your research and kind of your perspectives how do you see how do you envision like sovereignty moving as we continue towards this like 2026 path that's a great question and um the two very um engaging questions that I could talk a great length about. Um, one is kind of more process, one is more uh, conceptual or interpretive. Uh, what I wouldn't, um, what I may have done in a different venue is start talking about these sentiments in contemporary legal parlance. The Doctrine of Discovery is a, a 19, uh, 15th century um, uh, generally a set of um, papal um, pronouncements that give justification for uh, uh, sort of largely the Iberian uh, uh, monarchs for gaining possessions to newly incorporated territories that have been outside of the uh, ownership of Christian peoples, it still animates contemporary American jurisprudence. That was used by Justice Ginsburg in the famous case in 2005 to deny the United Nation of, of New York uh, uh, the reacquisition of authority over lost lands in the county of Sherrill. Um, so, survivance, taken from a literary, native literary theory, so refusal from, a, from another Native American academics. Those are kind of conceptual paradigms for analysis. Sovereignty is a legal reality that has a kind of a long history. It goes back, <laughs> predates the arrival of English speakers to North America. 
you know, by, you know the, these dynamics go just go so far back. And so the Constitution, you know, is central, obviously, to understanding these things. And um, I think another great compromise for this period is how the kind of sentiments around from the revolutionary era do eventually get moderated by the Constitutional Convention, even though Native peoples are excluded from the body politic through the Constitution's uh, establishment of representational forms in which Indians are not taxed and thereby not part of the body politic. Um, that's also written into the 14th Amendment. I think I read that um, Native peoples aren't given formal U.S. citizenship until the 1920s. Um, these are long-standing legal, statutory, um, juridical uh, histories that are essential to kind of uh, contemporary practice of the American uh, sovereign authority. Um, and so the, the contemporary world of Indian law policy is often deeply kind of uh, nervous or anxious about cases that come before the Supreme Court because so much can be Un unmade, essentially, <clears throat> with uh, new laws or new rulings that challenge laws. And a big case was held last summer that many people worried it was going to really threaten the potential um, its authority of tribal communities to protect their children um, due to a 1970 statute that was instituted to help tribes you know, do just that. So, these are kind of real concerns, and sometimes if you look through the oral arguments or the opinions or the concurrences or the, uh, other uh, published writings, uh, uh, people say crazy things about history. So history is a kind of really incredible uh, tool, essentially, that can be wielded like a weapon or forms a shield. Um, and indigenous peoples, because of the power of Congress that, uh, that kind of emerges in the late 19th and early 20th century, have to kind of always staying guard and vigilant against new ideas that might strip them of kind of essential resources, such as their children, which is federal policy, and that's in chapter 12, you know, right? It, um, it's all about federal government trying to move Indians off reservations, ter terminate their political status, uh, subdivide their communities, and help state and private adoption foster institutions uh, take care of their children. I am a descendant of boarding school survivors, and I wanted to have your opinion about the American Indian Civilization Act. That would be 100 years old in 2024. Right, next year. And um, I wanted to know how you think that this should be viewed, this anniversary, from a Native and a non-Native perspective. I write about this in Chapter 11. Um, and it was initiated in part by many boarding school survivors themselves. Many of whom had formed uh, the first national intertribal political association in U.S. history called the Society of American Indians, founded in 1911, two years after the founding of the national uh, the NAACP. Um, and many of its uh, leaders were very active, both in uh, uh, the 19th Amendment, and, or the 20th Amendment, and the uh, 19th Amendment, and uh, the passage of the Indian Citizenship Act. Um, so they fought, they took really justifiable pride in this kind of legislative advocacy that they were involved in. Um, and it was done in part to challenge the then, as you likely are aware, uh, operative policies of the federal government toward of, towards Indian assimilation on a national scale. And one of the ironies or paradoxes of that national policy of boarding school education was that it trained, in many ways, its most vociferous uh, opponents. So people who went through vocational manual training and came out of it thinking, gee, I don't want to do that much more. Um, and I don't want to see my family and children subjected to it. So uh, there's a kind of heavy emphasis in the, those sections on various kind of indigenous strategies of action and activism. But generally speaking, individual rights are not the kind of panacea for Native America as they have been for other minoritized or subordinated communities in America. Um, 
individual rights um, to speech or um, gathering or enfranchisement are not what tribal communities have been advocated for. We want autonomy and uh, sovereignty and a recognition of communal and individual um, uh, kind of liberties. And, so and I, I don't, I see some of these things a little casually, and I don't mean to offend the, the more kind of um, deeply committed academics who sometimes take some of my offhand remarks um, in unfortunate ways. Uh, humor, as anyone in the Indian country knows, is one way of surviving <laughs> the kind of challenges that have confronted us. Uh, the entertainment respond to them. So, there's a famous textbook from American history that uh, my colleague at Columbia, Eric Foner, has authored called Give Me Liberty. And Eric um, is a great, the greatest living American story, widely regarded, multiple Pulitzer Prize winner, um, just tremendously changed the study, particularly of the Civil War and his African He's never really been able to make Indians part of his American history. And my daughter is now at Columbia. <laughs> taking classes with Michael, uh, um, uh, um, was assigned to his textbook in high school. And basically, it's in the North-South history of um, the 19th century residential politics. And the West uh, doesn't really figure much Indians out much out there. Uh, that's common in elite academic training and teaching, sadly. I've been doing this 15 years in the Ivy Leagues. I feel like I have some standing to come from the subject. Um, some of that animates the critiques and the introduction of the book that some scholars have had been a little testy about. But so the joke I'm about to make isn't intended, to, and Eric would laugh if he was here, I hope. Um, American Indians, we don't want liberty. Uh, we, our textbook would be, don't give me liberty. <laughs> you give me liberty, you're taking uh, you know, the kind of communal relationships we have with each other, with the land, with the uh, non-human species, uh, our kind of ancestors. Stay away with your ideas of locking and property, please, you know. <laughs> Keep uh, your ideas of religious uh, salvation, you know, perhaps yourselves. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it, but, you know, don't give it too much to us, particularly at a young age and in deeply kind of institutionalized, not by the forms. Um, that is not kind of what so the Citizenship Act is an attempt to bring the Americans finally into the body politic of the United States so that the juridical constitutional framework of the United States can be more adequately uh, achieved. Um, and it's not coincidental at the same time that the immigration and naturalization programs are restricting European immigration. And, um, and there's a lot of interesting like, kind of legal history that um, could form its own kind of subject matter of conferences. Um, the United States has acquired large colonies throughout the late 19th and early 20th century. It governs hundreds of thousands of people in many places. Um, and they're also subordinated to doctrines of law in which they are also not citizens. Right? Um, so they're governed by a new government, millions of people in the Philippines. Do so. And so and many of the things that happen to Indians are concerning happen in those places. So it's conceivable, but no one's really probed this question. And many of those native advocates who are involved in the drafting of the so, so with, uh, citizenship um, legislation and conversations around it are saying things like, we may need this. You know, we may not really want it the way uh, we, uh, but we may need this because uh, other things may happen. Um, so it's a really interesting question um, that isn't as universal in the sense that it might appear um, initially. It's just about time for one more question, if we have one, but we need to be brief. Um, okay. Thank you all so Oh, good. May I just make a comment? Um, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Blackhawk, for your book and for your speech tonight. My mother uh, and I traveled here. Um, we are not scholars, we are not academics, uh, but we are Native Americans. And 